happened to have with me a cat of nine tails that I ordered from a guy out of California. Now, I'm a pretty good sized gentleman. I'm about 6'1", 240. And, you know, to be able to swing that uh, to the point with anger and hatred Um, pretty devastating. But the, the truth of the matter is, I did that to Jesus. And you did that to Jesus. Because it was for our sins that he died. And one did not have to look any further for torture than Rome. They were masters at it. They were masters at it. If I was to do a top 10 list and move backward from Rome, what they would do was absolutely atrocious. Two of those 10 I can't even mention to you today. They would cut open a donkey, remove all the inward parts, the convicted person would be sewn inside with their head popping out and they would be left out in the sun and would suffocate and the maggots would begin to eat from the inside out. Oh, that was one of the least ones. It's interesting to note that many times St. Gregory described a heinous torture that was performed on young women by people of Heliopolis while under Roman rule. Now I want you to get a good grip of what was happening in Rome. Any virgin who was to undergo this torture was first given to the gladiators. After the young woman was no longer a virgin, she was publicly stripped and her belly was sliced open. Handfuls of barley were stuffed into her, and then they sewed her back up, only to be given to wild hogs. These are documented facts. Number eight and number seven, I cannot even tell you what was happening in ancient Rome. Tiberius, one of the most feared and hated emperors in Roman history, for good reason, was almost always in a foul mood. And he took that out on Christians. And they would, excruciating tortures, they would just, it was just play to them. They tortured a senator, one documentation said, the Emperor Caligula, who was just as cruel as old Tiberius and Nero, at one point had a senator slit open. The senator survived, and Caligula ordered that his eyes be removed, and after that, hot pincers were used to take out his internal organs. To add to the degradation, the senator was in pieces, and according to Roman belief, death was not punishment but release. The torture was the punishment, and death was only allowed after a certain amount of pain and terror had been felt at the soldier's discretion. Number five was nailed into barrel. Some people were meant to suffer long than others before the sweet release of death. Under Emperor Domitian, Christians were tortured in the most horrific ways. One of the most disgusting tortures performed involving smearing a Christian with honey and milk. The victim was then nailed into a barrel and force-fed parasite-ridden food. The parasites feasted on the insides of the victim, whose body began to rot inside the barrel. After two weeks of this torture, the victim would finally die and become a martyr for the Christian religion. Number four, buried alive, one of Emperor Nero's famous feats. He took delight in having people buried alive. He almost exclusively saved this punishment for vestal virgins who broke their vows of chastity. In one account, Nero forced himself on the priestess Rubria. For her punishment, she was entombed inside a small cave and left to starve to death. Another torture supported by Nero 
involved the accused digging his own grave. And after it was dug, a stake was set inside the grave. And the accused was then bound and pushed into the grave. If the crime was minor, he would be pushed so that the stake pierced through his heart. Anyone convicted of a heinous crime was pushed so that the stake mortally wounded them. They were left to die in excruciating pain and then were buried alive. Number three, believe it or not, eaten through the middle. Executioners often used animals to carry out their barbarity. And as the case with the cauldron torture, this was particular cruelty. A starved animal, such as a rat, a dog, or a cat, was placed inside small cauldron. The opening of the cauldron was then fastened to the belly of the accused. The executioner would hold a flame to the back of the cauldron, making the inside extremely hot. The animal would panic and try to escape, and the only soft ground for it to dig its way out was through the belly of the victim. Number two, that you probably didn't know about Rome, the bee basket. One bizarre form of torture involves stripping a person down and stuffing them into a large, loosely woven basket. The basket was then hoisted up into a tree containing a large, active beehive. The bees were quickly angered, and the person inside the basket was then stung to death. The accused was meant to suffer an ag agony for as long as possible. However, there were cases where the victim of this torture died relatively quickly due to being allergic to bee strings. And the number one in which our, our Jesus, our Lord, chose was the Roman crucifixion. It was the most brutal of all tortures that the Romans took pride in. Ancient Romans loved a good crucifixion. It was at one time the primary method used to torture and kill countless numbers of slaves. Crucifixion didn't always involve nailing the accused to a cross. Sometimes the accused was stripped and his head was covered and tied upside down onto the cross fork then being flogged, sometimes until dead, depended on the Roman soldier's mood of the day. If the accused was not supposed to die by continuous flogging, the next course of action involved nailing his hands to the crossbeam. He was then hoisted onto a planted post, and his feet, as you saw in the video, were nailed to the post. He might be left there to die a slow death. Many Romans, when they would come in and out of the city, you have to remember Rome was in charge. They actually would crucify thieves face to face. And as one began to die, death and decay would begin to eat through the other one. Now, I know that you are Americans. And I know that you don't like to hear those things, but you've probably watched more scary movies about gore than you want to ever admit. But Rome were ruthless. Now, isn't it interesting that Jesus chose the death and he took crucifixion? Now, why am I telling you that? It's resurrection morning. It's Easter. We celebrate. Because I believe this. I believe that you cannot have a resurrection until there's a crucifixion. Jesus said that unless a grain or a seed falls to the ground and dies, it cannot spring to life. And as it was with Christ, it will be with you and I. But I got to thinking about, well, do we go back through John 11? Do we go through the Gospels that I am the resurrection and the life? And I just thought this morning that I would just take you just a moment. When, when we talk about in churches, we have a different lingo. We talk about being born again. We talk about being lost. Now, a lot of people in the world do not understand what that is. They don't understand what we're talking about. When we talk about sanctification and justification and glorification, you know, Christians have their own language, and we have that understanding. But the biblical concept of lost, the New Testament idea of lost, is found in the Greek verb apolumai. Now, that word comes from apo, that means away, and alumai, that means destruction or ruin or death. So there was first the physical death, and people often ask, why do we have to die? Why couldn't God fix a, a, a better way? Well, because of Adam and Eve's sin, that's what we call original sin in the garden, right? Death enters the world. And we all die because we're all sinners. 
For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No pope, no pastor, no judge, no lawyer, whatever. Everyone is guilty. Everyone has sinned against God. And God is holy and God is just. God is not this grandfather guy in the sky with a long beard that just winks at our sinfulness. There was a price that had to be paid. And no one in this room and no one in the past, present, or future could pay that price but one. Jesus Christ, very God of very God, begotten and not made. He was the holy, paschal lamb. It was the only way. There's no way that Jesus Christ could have ever, ever committed a sin. Because if you go back to the Old Testament, you could not offer an animal that was spotted or blemished or diseased, or you'd be put to death. It was all instructional to Christ. Now, we've heard that through the years. But there's a physical death that comes, but it's not the one that he's talking about. It's the second death. In Matthew 2.13, Herod desired to kill the Christ child. That's physical death. In Matthew 8.25, the disciples feared they would uh, perish in the boat during a storm on the Sea of Galilee. They thought they would drown. Again, physical death. But they talk more about the spiritual death. And that's what Christ came to die for. Because, listen, the day that every soul is born, you are going to live in eternity somewhere. The body returns to the grave, but you are created a living, breathing soul, and you have a spirit. And at death, we lose this spacesuit, and we move into a glorified body with God. But how you live on this side matters. It matters. It's not just intellectually believing that Christ died, though that is important. Listen, the demons believe that Jesus is the Christ. And if just believing intellectual knowledge saves you, then the demons are saved. And we know that's a lie. Are you listening? So what would be attached to that? I mean, the demons know that is the Christ constantly through the Bible, through demonic deliverance. We all found that out and read through the scriptures that how Jesus delivered demons from people and all these different types of things. Blind people made to see again, lame made to walk. Here's the key. And what we battle today is a word antinomianism, that people believe today that you just have to have an intellectual knowledge of it, and that's what saves you, and that your behavior does not have to change or match your faith. Now, that's a false gospel. Your behavior matters. Your behavior models how much you believe and trust and follow God. Absolutely, it matters. And Paul addressed that. Now, a a lost person in a spiritual sense describes those who are not born again spiritually, who do not know, who have rejected the saving grace of God through Christ dying on the cross for our sins, the sins of the whole world. That's John 3, 16, and I'm sure you all know that. But sin is exactly what Adam and Eve did. They disobeyed God. Now, part of being lost is being spiritually dead. Original sin in the garden brought death to humanity. That's a physical death. And although we all face death, spiritual death is where we have great concern. Spend an eternity with God or spend an eternity with the fallen angel devil. There is a real place called hell. There's a real place called heaven. Now, biblically, we know Paul was caught up into the third heaven. We don't know all the full levels of that. We have what the word of God tells us. But that's real. So people that begin to tell you, well, I don't believe in hell, well, it's, it's smack dab in the word of God. And all Christians must believe the 66 books that God wrote, inspired by men, right, full of the Holy Spirit of God. That is the word of truth. My prayer is that the word of truth is what would compel me to move forward and to trust and to walk in God. Because why? The selfish desires that I have are for my flesh. I want to gratify my flesh. I want to come to God on my own terms. I want to do Christianity my way. I want to do it when I want to. I'll go to church when I feel like it. I'll, I'll control the things. And that's not what that, that Christ is bidding you and me to do. He bids a man to come and die. 
And until we remove every desire that you and I ever want to accomplish and forsake it all for Jesus Christ, we've not really come to die. Now, that's a big difference between Christ being my Savior and Christ being my Lord. And Acts tells us he was both Christ my Lord and Savior. Can't have one without the other. So if he's your Lord, then that requires a behavior. I can't say he's my Savior. A lot, a lot, a lot of people do. But he's not my Lord yet. Maybe later on I'll just get that. And that's, that's another false gospel, the gospel being peddled around out there. So we know because of sin, God judges the world. Adam and Eve's sinful rebellion. Listen, it wasn't eating the fruit that's bad. It had nothing to do with the fruit. It had everything to do with what God said. All this is yours. Stay away from that. Right? You know how that is. Tell a two-year-old that. All the playground is yours. Stay away from the stove. What do they head to? The stove. That's the fallen human nature of man. We rebel against God. The unsaved man is dead because he is alienated from God's life, according to Ephesians 2.18. In fact, I love this, because even fools have a holiday. The fool has said in his heart that there is no God. Now, that's a biblical verse from Psalms 53, verse 1. Now, I didn't say that. Raka is the word, and we're told not to call anybody a fool. Right? Mr. T got famous from that. Fool. You might have said it. You're acting like a fool. Right? But the Bible says the fool has said in their heart that there is no God. To know Christ, to be drawn by the Holy Spirit, who reveals our need of a Savior, of our sinful Nature and life of being spiritually born again is everything for the next life. Now, how important is this for the next life? I'll tell you. The word says this. It becomes crystal clear in Matthew 7, 23, when Jesus looks out at someone and says, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I don't even know who you are. Many will say, haven't I done this in your name, that in your name? Didn't I go to church? Didn't I feed the poor? Didn't I do all these things? Listen, the reality is, okay, you can't earn salvation. It is a free gift of God. In fact, people can't even be saved or born again unless they are drawn by the Holy Spirit of God. And so when we see preachers from many years ago, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church for years, and, and they would do long invitations, and the piano player would play probably 15, 20 minutes, and I was knees giving out and weighing and dropping down, and like, well, we got, you know, listen, I'm about to get born again again. You know, that'll get me home in time. You know, but that, that can't happen. It's not humanly possible for me or you to save anyone. That is the work of God. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, the reason we go out and witness and share our faith and our hope and our love in the marketplace and our families is because we don't know who the elect are. Only God does. So you can't say, well, I, I don't like so-and-so, so, you know, get them the whip. She, did, she talked about me. Let's take her down. It doesn't work that way, guys. It just, it's all about God. It's all about him knowing in eternity past, present, and future. So we go in faith because we don't know. And there are people that make up the body of Christ that will be shocked in that day. Listen, I went to church with a guy for 25 years, served on three committees. 25 years in the body of Christ functioning, only to come to find out like about a, a, a year ago came to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior and became born again. How often does that happen? So it's not about rituals. It's not about walking into bricks and mortar. It's about having a relationship with the very Son of God. When I was told that at a young age, it floored me. I scarcely could get a relationship with my father or my mother 
in those regards, let alone my family, and that was pretty negative most of the time, but when someone said you can have a relationship with Christ, man, that just blew me away. Why in the world would a holy God, a righteous God, a sovereign God want to fellowship with me? You and I can't comprehend that kind of love. All right. At salvation, all right, Bobby. At 25, I gave my heart and life to Christ. I confessed my sins. Now it says believe on the name of Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of issues around those things. We believe on the name of Christ for salvation. But at that day I did. And then I became a disciple. Now there's a word for you. What does that mean? It means student. It means learner. I've been at this 32 years and I'm still learning. Still growing. Still obtaining things, still making mistakes. But God in progressive sanctification is working that out, helping me work out my salvation with fear and trembling. Listen, I love this. MacArthur said this one time. He said, listen, if you could lose your salvation, you would. You would. But there is the sustaining power of God who gives you the faith to respond, the words to understand, the power to say yes, and the sustaining power that he that began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until either he comes back or you die. But that is the work of God. It is all of God. My part is to abide in him and he in me. It's important to understand that. It is said that sin in following my selfish desires over God's truth, that is what hurts me. You know when I get in trouble? When I want to do it like Frank Sinatra sang about. I want to do it my way. Oh, I got a good insurance policy with Jesus. I I know I'm saved, but now I'm going to go live the way I want to live. Doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. I think that actually defiles the resurrection of who God is. It cost God everything. True discipleship has no preconditions. Having placed our faith in Jesus as our Lord, 1 Corinthians says our life is no longer our own. We have been bought with a price. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor who gave up his life daily on behalf of the German people, during the time of Hitler and the Nazis, finally died for his faith at the end of a rope in a Nazi prison, once said this, when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. We even want that on our own terms. The concept of discipleship has been greatly watered down in our modern age from time to time. It's a review. But when we come to the Lord's table and we begin to revisit what Christ instituted through the sacraments, uh, through baptism, through the Lord's Supper, it's a very solemn moment of time. Now, if this is our part where we prep for the Lord's Supper, so if there are some mothers that want their babies to, to celebrate communion, you are free to grab your babies and bring them back in. We're transitioning with the kids coming back. But the only thing left for me to do is to take up my cross daily and to literally live for Jesus. Now, I admit it was my sin of envy, rebellion, pride, lust, murder, adultery, slander, etc. that put Jesus on that cross. But when I placed my faith in him, I died once and for all to the power of sin over me. And now because he lives, I'm able to live the resurrected life of righteousness by his resurrection power. Romans 6, the cross of Christ is a daily reminder that our flesh needs to be put to death. Paul said, I mortify my flesh daily. And the apostle Paul said years later to the Galatians, now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. And I close with this. The cross of Christ, John Stott wrote these words, and I quote, the cross undermines our self-righteousness. We stand before it with a bowed head and a broken spirit 
And there we remain until the Lord Jesus speaks to our hearts his word of pardon and acceptance. And we, gripped by his love and brimful of thanksgiving, go out into the world to live our lives out in his service. My wife and I were having a conversation the other night. And she was telling me that she had a friend that she went and visited. And he was dying. He was a man that was dying. Literally... Um, hospice was already taken care of. This guy was dying and looked that way. And the prayer was that he would just receive Christ. And that's what, with my wife and the other lady, they petitioned together that, that God might spare his life, that he might receive Christ. And so mustering up the courage and strength, she approached the man and, and said, listen, is there some way that I can pray for you I know you're close to death's door. Is there some way? And the man literally said, I don't want anything to do with that. Moments away. Moments away from death. And literally rejected it all. That's the truth of where we are. So... The Who's Your One campaign next Sunday is huge. Everything that happened on that cross, everything that we celebrate through communion, and the, it's huge. It's huge. Because it's the Great Commission. It's the Great Commandment. Right? And watch this. We even make it optional. Although it's a command from God, we Christians, we have made it optional. We'll tell you, God, when we're going We'll tell you if we want to forsake it all. We'll, tell, we'll dictate to you, God. And I want you to know that grieves his heart. It's hard to claim lordship salvation and you say, no, Lord. Lordship salvation is saying, yes, Lord. Amen? I want to encourage you as you think about the resurrection. I wanted you to see the brutal punishment that Rome inflicted on our Jesus, our Lord, he did that for me. He did that for you, right? He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and by his stripes we are healed. And he says, now do this until I come as much as you want to. Think about me. Think about what I did. Think about what happened. But listen, it didn't end in the grave, right? We just went through Holy Week. I was praying through each of the days and each of the events. We did Palm Sunday. You know, we talked about Monday. He went into the temple. He overturned the tables. They were making it a money changer place. He was destroying it, right? I mean, so he happens, you know, uh, Wednesday was a day off for him. Monday, Thursday is a Latin phrase. It's a mandate. And so that's when he gave the command to them, you know, a new covenant that I share with you. And what he was saying is, when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. The bread is symbolic of the body of Christ. Now, we have unleavened bread. So it's symbolic just simply of the body of Christ that was broken for you and for me. And, and then we have the juice. Uh, we don't have real wine here. Um, we use grape juice, so don't get excited. It's, it's Welch's. I hope you like Welch's. But again, that's not the purpose why you're invited to this table. Okay? You can do that on your own. But the beauty of this is that we pause and we think about you know, Jesus, you really went through a lot for me. And you know how often I rebel against him and drift from him and make excuses why I don't live for him and justify my brain, oh, I'll give up eight things, but I'll not give up those final two things, right? We play this little mental, intellectual chess game all of our life, and all he says, listen, I bid you to come and die. You know, there's a wonderful quote that says, until you master self, there's no one else to master. I'm not called to be an ordained minister of the gospel because I have anything better than you. I am a sinner saved by grace through faith that not of works, lest any man should boast. It is a gift of God. It's a calling and a vocation, and I work very hard at my prayer life and studying and doing the things that God calls me to do to serve. 
And it's with my pleasure that I'm going to ask the elders if they'll come up and take their place uh, to serve Holy Communion. But I want us to pray, and I would be foolish to not give you a moment to examine yourself. And that's what the Bible says to do. Hey, take a moment and ask the Holy Spirit, hey, is there anything that I need to get right, okay, with you, Jesus, okay, and do that. Um, And then when you're ready, then we want you to just make your way down. And then it is a holy moment, so the best you can once you're served, um, you know, try not to engage Facebook or get back on the phone or start talking. We're asking that you just kind of make that a holy moment. And if you come back, you know, it'd be awesome if you'd pray for me. I could use your prayers or you pray for other people or who's your one? Who are you praying for? So I want to do that and I want to pray. Father, in this moment...